Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,989. We're wrapping up this week celebrating the Concord in the Hills that takes place on Saturday, February 12th in beautiful Fountain Hills, Arizona with a very special guest today with over a thousand cars. This is the first event in the new year you don't want to miss. Learn more, go to concordinthehills.org. Be prepared to be inspired. I actually won Sebring 12-hour race with Jeff Brabham uh, uh, in 1990, having got back to winning major international races. When I was on the podium, Mark, and we're in celebration, and we have champagne, and we did a great job, a thought just flashed through my mind. Huh, winning really isn't what I thought it would be. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. I am thrilled today because I'm in Phoenix, Arizona still as this whole week of celebrating the Concord in the Hills has been happening here on Cars Yeah. And guess who I'm with? Derek Daly. Derek, welcome to Cars Yeah. Do you have any gear? And are you ready to release the clutch? I am ready, willing, and my heart is pounding. <laughs> I have a feeling maybe that's not true, but <laughs> you're making me feel good, Derek, and that's what you're all about. Now, before I give you a proper introduction, tell me one little thing that maybe people don't know about a guy who's so well known as you. Um, uh, I suppose what is not well known, and because I don't remember whether I've ever spoken about it to anybody is I am an avid gardener in my later life. No kidding. Yeah. You know, this is very interesting, Derek, because one of your fellow Concord in the Hills guests who's been on this week, he does the same thing, although he propagates different kinds of cacti <laughs> and loves to go out and uh, graft pieces onto cacti. He's probably got some very interesting saguaros <laughs> for what you've got in the desert there. But I do the same thing, and I'm, I'm thinking about getting into bonsai. I find it very zen-like, stress reduced Reducing, you know, growing plants requires patience and skill. I mean, is that why you enjoy doing it? I'm very much an amateur. And so I started back in Indianapolis. I live in the Phoenix in the winter, Indianapolis in the summertime. And I literally just got into it as a hobby. I'm not an expert. I don't study it that much. I'm very much a, uh, you know, hands-on, you know, suck it and see type. So, but creating creating stuff that looks nice just became just became a sort of a hobby uh and 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 it's developing into a bit of a passion yeah i, I like doing it too my neighbor laughs at me because he said gosh you'll spend hours on one rhododendron making it look like this beautiful thing i just go out my loppers and you know, lop away. And I, I don't know. <laughs> I think for me, I'm, I've got the design background. I like to stand back and do a little clip, stand back. And it's really more about getting away from the computer, getting away from, you know, all the things in our lives and, and just being able to breathe fresh air and, and be outdoors and, and enjoy taking care of the plants. That's what I like about it. And there's no, no noisy racing engines <laughs> flying down the streets. Yeah. <laughs> so you can, you can relax. Yeah, well, let me give you a proper introduction because that's definitely something you've been around in your life. Derek Daly is a world-class Formula One and Indy 500 driver, a master of fast, entrepreneur, best-selling author, and 25-year network television analyst. He competed against world champions, raced for some of the world's most successful teams, won races all over the world, lived in Monte Carlo, he's dined with royalty, and was almost killed three times. Oh my gosh, how's that for, for an exciting time? His life has been breathtaking to say the least. Uh, with his native Irish wit, he's a Hall of Fame race car driver who presents powerful analogies with straightforward and fascinating details delivered with energy and humor, making him one of the world's most popular sports commentators and speakers. You'll see Derek at the Concord in the Hills, most likely hanging around many of the vintage cars parked on the grass there. We'll be back in just a minute, but first a word from our valued sponsor, so give him a little love. Keep the seatbelts on. We're here at Derek Daly. We'll be right back. Covercraft's newest three-layer all-climate cover 
is especially engineered for moderate weather conditions and it's treated with an extra UV resistant formula. It's soft, it's breathable, and it's easy to store, all while pampering your paint, providing maximum UV rain and dust protection. If you live where it's windy, no worries. Simply add their gust guards for windy conditions to add extra protection to keep your cover in place. Your three-layer all-climate cover is custom-tailored with Covercraft's attention to detail, form and fit with the quality and attention to detail that's been their tradition since 1965. Covercraft protects cars, trucks, motorcycles, RVs, trailers, and watercraft, too. Every one of my vehicles is protected with a Covercraft cover. And I have a deal for you. Use the code YEAH21, Y-E-A-H-21, at Covercraft.com, and you'll get 10% off your Covercraft order Plus, free shipping. That's right. So get 10% off with free shipping by simply using the code YA21 at checkout. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you. When it was time to renew my collector car policy, my carrier raised my rates by a lot. But why? My usage was the same. My car's value was the same. And I had never made a claim. I didn't even have a ticket. The only change was their rate and they had no reason why. What's with that? I researched my options. I spoke to others. And with American Collectors Insurance is where I now have my policy. What a difference. A live person actually answers the phone. She spent time learning about me and my Porsche Turbo, the one I call my orange crush, and provided a reasonable quote. American Collectors Insurance now protects my special ride. I'm saving hundreds of dollars and I can sleep at night knowing my baby is properly insured. Why wait until your next premium is due? Give them a call today for your personal agreed value quote. Call 866-AC1-YEAH. That's 866-224-9324. Tell them you're a friend of mine, Mark Green at Cars Yeah. American Collectors Insurance. Classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. Automotive enthusiasts just like you and me. That's American Collectors Insurance. All right, Derek, so let's dive a little deeper in the corner, something you've done many, many times. Before we talk about your involvement with Concord in the Hills, I want to go back in time a little bit and talk about your racing career and sports commentating because you're one of these guys that your face and your voice those of us who follow racing, it's like, oh, I've known this guy forever. He's been around forever. Now, I'm not calling you old, so don't think I'm going <laughs> yeah. I'm going there. But can we go back a little bit to when you first started racing and why you found this sport so fascinating and then how you've evolved it into the commentating career that you had? And now you get out and do keynotes and you, you give speeches and motivational speeches. I mean, you've just tied this passion for cars into your entire life. And the most amazing thing, Mark, is it wasn't necessarily planned out. Trying to become a racing driver was definitely planned out. But what happened after that for a second career uh, in television broadcasting and then a third career in uh, corporate keynote speaking, they were never planned out. They almost happened by accident. I'm so fortunate that I was actually able to use the platform of the sport as a second career and a third career. And even today with the keynotes that I do, I'm able to share the high performance principles that are, that are woven deep down into the sport with corporate America. So as the very fiber of these corporations can be altered by understanding the high performance principles of a sport that I happen to spend most of my life in. So I love doing it. But it all started with me back in a little country called Ireland. (laughs) And the year that it started, we didn't even have a racing circuit in Ireland. Wow. The only thing they had was they closed off a village, a typical village in Ireland, you know, has a Catholic church, a grocery store and about nine or 10 pubs. (laughs) And so that became a racetrack. And the local well-to-do, well-heeled, wealthy people would bring out their racing cars uh, uh, and, and race literally on the village streets. And my dad took me to see it one day, and I was completely mesmerized by the color and the smell and the noise and the speed. And I was only 12 years of age. And um, I told my dad right there and then, I'm going to be a professional racing driver. Wow. Yeah. And there was no path. Yeah. Nobody had ever done it before. Nobody from the Republic of Ireland had ever made it to Formula One. It was a wild dream, but that was the day that changed my life for all intents and purposes. Oh, my gosh. That's incredible. Well, when you got started, what were the first? What was the first vehicle you drove in? Was it a cart like a lot of young people started? 
No, I didn't have the money to uh, afford a go-kart. I went racing in a demolition derby jalopy series. Okay. Buy something for, at that stage, it was about 15 pounds, which is about $30, something lying on the side of the road. Take the glass out of it, uh, make some sort of a roll bar. And if you made it out of wood, that was fine. Wood? Uh, really? Yeah. Put a seat belt into it. And if you made it, that out of rope, that's fine too. Oh my gosh. Uh, and away you went. You crashed and bashed and hope you could fix it up for the following uh, weekend. Every Sunday we did it. And that was my introduction to motor racing. It was the only thing I could do. I was 16 at the time. And although I thought it was early at the time, I was the youngest driver to hold a competition license in Ireland at, at that time. This was 1969. And nowadays, as you can imagine, I'll be, I'll be at least 10 years too late because <laughs> kids race carts, you know, at four or five and six years of age. Yeah. So, I mean, the model is, is very different these days, which I completely understand. Well, you drove in some of the most wonderful series, Formula One, Indy 500. I mean, you drove a lot of different vehicles. W was there one that stood out for you that was perhaps a favorite? If so, why? Um, yes, there are racing cars that hold a special place in my heart that on that day, in that race, in that environment, in front of all those people, you know, everything just clicked and came together. Mm -hmm. And I would say the two that stand out for me was the Chevron B42 Formula 2 car racing at Nigello in 1978 when everything came together and I dominated the event. And at, at that stage, there were Formula 1 drivers in the making like Eddie Cheever, Bruno Giacomelli, uh, Didier Pironi, people like that all in the race. Yeah. And then the other one, believe it or not, was the Tyrrell Formula 1 car, the 010 at Brands Hatch. At the British Grand Prix 1980 when I finished fourth but the car on that day just I, I was just at one with the car and I got everything out of the car uh it was it was uh, you know, it was the start of the turbo era so the turbo cars were a lot faster but those two cars just stand out to me as you know fond memories and you're right I've driven a lot of racing cars but they just consistently stand out as something that you know I never believed I could do when I was a laborer in the iron ore mines of Australia, because that's how I financed my early racing. Really? Wow. Well, I want to fast forward a little bit because you're such an eloquent speaker. You're an inspirational speaker. And of course, this your sports commentary career lasted for a long time. Is that a craft that you learned or you just always had the the gift of gab as they say because a lot of people go on to be sports commentators from their fields but they're not really that great and they mm -hmm. don't last yeah. others do yeah. how did that all happen i ended up with a 24-year career which is quite remarkable it is. so yeah i got hurt quite badly in 1984 at the michigan uh international speedway uh i was in therapy for almost three years. I was out of full-time racing for two and a half years, but I went to the Las Vegas IndyCar race, which I think was the last race of the season in 1984. I was in a wheelchair and I was interviewed by ESPN. And a week later, that interview turned into a 10-year contract. Oh my gosh. Because I, 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 got, I got a call about a week later from ESPN. I said, Derek, while you're recovering, would you like to do some color commentary? And I said, uh, yeah, sure. I had absolutely no idea what color commentary was. <laughs> I'd never heard the term before. Yeah. I wasn't familiar with American television vernacular, but they were going to pay me <laughs> to yeah, talk to about talk. races yeah. while I was in recovery. And then and then doing uh, junior series in America, suddenly they said, well, would you move into doing Formula One for us? Now they're going to pay me to travel the world wow. to talk about racing. And so... I got back to full-time racing in 87 and 88, but I was already established in television broadcasting, so I had two careers. Yeah. <laughs> and then when I decided, after we won Sebring 12-hour race with Jeff Brabham uh, uh, in 1990, having got back to winning major international races, when I was on the podium, Mark, and we're in celebration, and we have champagne, and we did a great job, a thought just flashed through my mind. Huh, winning really isn't what I thought it would be after all the struggles after my accident to get back there. Mm -hmm. And that was when I knew that was the beginning of the end. Mm -hmm. Having got myself back up to, onto the winning step of the podium, 
I knew in my heart, I've now satisfied my own personal drive to get back to be successful. Now I can leave the sport on my own terms. Nice. And I knew my days were numbered. I was going to do maybe one more season. And then I was going to dovetail straight into television broadcasting that I'd already uh, started three or four years earlier. So I'd, I, I had an ideal trans crossover sure. um, to, to the second career. And there were some people... There were keys, key people in that in, in that transition because it was there was a friend of mine in in Indianapolis called Terry Lingner. Mm -hmm. Terry Lingner was either the second or third producer that ESPN hired when they started. Terry was from was from Indianapolis. Having worked for ESPN, he wanted to then set up his own production company. They happened to be based in Indianapolis, and they produced a a, a show called Speed Week every single week. On ESPN, Speed Week was produced from a studio in Indianapolis. And Terry told me one time, he said, very seldom do we get drivers right out of their driving career who can talk, think, and listen all at the same time. Mm -hmm. He said, I was one of the unusual people could, that could do that, which is why probably I, I began to get comfortable and grow the career pretty quickly. But it was an amazing set of circumstances, all brought about by an accident. Unfortunately, it was my accident that brought about the second career. Wow. It's a fascinating story. And then that dovetails nicely into your keynote speaking, motivational speaking, going to companies and then tying in the yeah. aspects of motorsports and what's needed to be a winner with the office space, right? Yes. And that was that gives me the biggest thrill right now because the sport that I've loved and been involved in for all my life, just about, can now be used as a platform to influence corporate America, to maybe have them see another way to stretch and push their people to the edges of what might be possible for them. But again, Mark, it happened by accident. I was in Indianapolis in 1983, I believe, and Desiree Wilson. Do you remember the name Desiree Wilson? I do, yes. South African, first female that I saw compete, who made it all the way to Formula One, and she was a remarkable talent. But she was asked to do an after, a, a lunchtime speech in Indianapolis at the old uh, Speedway Motel right here on, oh, wow. on the, uh, 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 right on the site of, of the Indy 500. She was so afraid to do it. She asked me, would I go with her just for moral support? I said, uh. sure, I'll take a free lunch. <laughs> so I go there. She gets up to speak and she says, you know, my, my dad bought me a go-kart and we went racing and we had a van and we did this and we did that. And I made it and I went to Europe and, and I made it to Formula One. And I'm, and I'm thinking quietly to myself, my story is more interesting than that. <laughs> is that what keynote speaking is about? Yeah. And so anyway, she got a round of applause. And then the MC turned and said to me, Derek, would you like to say anything? Oh. Now, remember, I was a kid who in my early years was afraid to be to speak to anybody. I was very introverted. Oh, really? When I went through school, oh, oh, when I went through school, if the teacher would ask me anything, I would go immediately gray, freeze, and shake. I, and, I, and I couldn't think straight. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. And so, so for me to get up in front of a public group, oh, it was a no, no. I was so shy. But for some reason, I stood up and began to give my uh, early days and what happened and how it happened. Now, I didn't think it was remarkable at all, but they all did think it was quite a remarkable story. I got a rounding uh, a, a, a applause afterwards, and I thought, huh. <laughs> <laughs> and then... A weird thing happened. Somebody asked me. Somebody else came and said, would you speak after lunch for our group? And we'll pay you $500. All right. They'll pay me? Yeah. And suddenly a whole new career. And then I was speaking somewhere and there was a, a, a speaking bureau in the audience and said, we'd like to represent you. We think you'd be a great sports speaker uh, uh, with a particular niche. And I thought, oh, Okay. Tell me what that entails. And it literally happened by accident and grew into where I was doing 25 or 30 events a year. And I really couldn't fit in anymore. And amazingly, the experiences, Mark, that I went through that I thought were normal for people became such an inspiration to corporations when they heard the story. And then you add on the value out of the deliverable, which is the message, the moral of the story. It became powerful and it grew and grew. And I got such a kick out of doing it because the sport, 
I loved was actually influencing corporate America. It was an amazing, it was an amazing third career. Wow. Yeah, what a, what a great story. I love it. Well, we're going to take a short break for our sponsors again, because we've got to talk about Conquer on the Hills or our friend Peter Volney is going to be going, Hey, how come these guys aren't talking about my event? <laughs> so, <laughs> so Peter, don't worry. It's coming up. Uh, sit tight, everybody. Keep your seatbelts on. Again, we're here with the great Derek Daly. We'll be right back. You listeners know I've been into car care my entire life. I am so excited to team up with AutoGeek in 2022. AutoGeek.net has been a leading source of auto detailing products, accessories, and expert knowledge for more than 20 years. What started in 1997 as a mail order catalog company has grown into a multi-website based e-commerce store that they are today. With a large online presence on its own website featuring close to 100 different brands, AutoGeek has grown to be the largest car care retailer in the country. Auto Geek's wholesale program serves accounts in over 30 countries and its retail sector ships worldwide. Go to autogeek.net for the best product selection on the internet today and their stellar technical support. autogeek.net. It's where I go for all my detailing needs. That's autogeek.net. I've discovered Linkage. It's a new quarterly publication and website that covers the automotive market, driving restoring, collecting, and discovering your passion for motor vehicles. Linkage is about experiences, opinions, and values. Linkage is an actual, informed, reasoned opinion based on firsthand experiences. A talented Linkage team covers the automotive world, the people who share your passion and mine, smart, considered, rational, and experienced opinions. Ones you can learn from and grow. That includes our passion that drives auctions and the collector car market. So come with me and join us on this journey and be sure to use the code cars. Yeah. When you subscribe and they'll give you $10 off. Boom. Linkage geared for the automotive life. Subscribe today at linkagemag.com. So let's talk about your involvement with Concord in the Hills, because this tremendous event, we're going to talk about the, the charity they do, the fundraising they do. But I know you're involved with this event. You've been attending the event. It's in a spectacular location. So give our listeners a little idea behind why they need to get a plane ticket and get out of the bad weather and come to Arizona and enjoy the Concord in the Hills. And so we've all heard of Pebble Beach and the Concourse. And, and it would be, some of us have been there and you go and you admire and you stand back. And about four years ago, um, I was invited to be a judge at the uh, Amelia Island Concourse oh, yeah. d'Elegance, which is just an amazing event. So you're there at the Radisson Hotel, uh, and, and the golf course just fills up with just this spectacular array of cars of all eras. And so while in the midst of enjoying these type of things, um, uh, about four or five, uh, five years ago, I began to uh, uh, live in Phoenix, for the winter time, and I came across this character from Australia called Peter Volney, who seemed to know everybody. <laughs> yeah, and I had heard of Concourse of the Hills, but what I didn't know is that it was the brainchild of Peter Volney, who's an Australian, moved to Canada, was successful there, and now lives in Phoenix, and decided to create a, a, an event, a Concourse event that, quite frankly, is growing so rapidly, it's beginning to rival every other concourse in the country. And it got to be friendly with Peter, and he said, would you and uh, uh, help me open it uh, last year? I said, well, of course I would. So myself, Ari Leyendag, Didier Thays, Lynn St. James, you know, all racing drivers who live around here officially mm-hmm. opened it uh, uh, last year, and we'll do it again this year. But the beauty of what this is, is at a time when half the country is covered in snow and ice, we have the most spectacular location around uh, a fountain in a lake um, with with every type of car. I mean, $20 million McLaren F1, $11 million Jaguar SS, racing cars, new, old, old British, a Morris Minor I saw last year, a Morris Minor, which I remember going around the streets in England and in Ireland, and my dad actually had one. Um, and, and just a, an amazing ar- array of cars, and it's free to everybody. Oh, that's amazing just part walk of walk in, yeah. So it's, it's a remarkable uh, event, and Peter... The passion for him is to use his contacts 
uses love of cars and help raise money for children, for the children's hospital. So it's such an amazing event with a great purpose. It is. You know, this week, listeners, you've heard me talk with uh, four other people involved with this, starting with Peter, of course, on Monday. And we've had uh, judges on the show, collectors, uh, amazing array of people that are involved with this. And as you've heard with Derek, he's involved, some great names, great past guests here on Cars Yeah. Ari's been a guest. Lynn St. James has been on the show three times, become friends with her through Cars Yeah and her involvement. And uh, I've tried to help her best I can promoting women, especially in the motorsports arena, which has been tremendous. I've had hundreds of women, especially race car drivers on the show. But this event is one of these things that is great to get away this time of year as I'm sitting here looking out my window and it's pouring rain. Yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. (laughs) The only moisture is that world record setting fountain that goes off every hour on this setting. But describe your 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 view of this setting, because it is spectacular. It is. I mean, it's it's. um... You, and if you jump on the website and you can see the uh, the drone picture of the location and, and, and the lake, I mean, tell me, is there, an, is, is there a nicer place to display a vehicle or just amble around and, and watch what goes on? Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. helicopters and all sorts of things that could fly in for display. And for me, Mark, I was influenced to go into the racing industry when I was 12 years old. My dad took me to my first car race. There are 10 and 11 and 12 year olds and maybe even younger kids who can actually walk up to these cars old and new or these helicopters and think you never know the dream that yes. gets uh, inspired into these young kids. You never know the, the direction. You never know what goes off, you know, in, 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 when they put their head down to sleep at night saying, wow. I'd love to fly a helicopter. I want to own one of those cars one day. I want to be part of this. You know, and that's sort of an internal drive that I understand very clearly. I love to think that there will be young generations of kids who are influenced potentially for the rest of their lives by attending an event that's so spectacular in every way, uh, this Concours on the Hills. You know, that's a great thing is taking kids. I started taking my son to Pebble Beach uh, during car week. I've been 31 times now, and he's been, I think, 18 times. Yeah. He actually uh, met a guy on Thursday during the tour who invited him to drive onto the lawn Sunday morning in his Jaguar D-Type. Uh, and I said, yeah. Blake, I've not even been able to drive onto the lawn. Because, <laughs> yeah. well, Dad, maybe you need to make better connections. Uh, all that with his eight-year-old voice. So, uh, yeah. you know, got to love him. But, you know, I want to talk a little bit about you with cars again. And mm. I'm going to ask you a question that I'm kind of hoping no one's ever asked you. I asked all my guests this question. It's kind of unique. If you were manifest as a car, Derek, this isn't what you want to be. This is how you perceive yourself, the man in the mirror, all this history you have of being in racing and sports commentating and talking to inspirational people and attending the Concord on the Hills and all these other events you've attended. What would Derek Daly be? Manifest as a car, but more importantly, why? Well, you're right. I've never been asked this question. (laughs) So because, because my life and my careers happened by accident, not really planned out. Mm -hmm. I never went to college because I was allergic to the way teachers taught people. I, I was a show me, don't tell me type of student. So if I was to, if I was to then fit into a car, I would be, if I was a vehicle, I would be a transformer. Okay. I would be a transformer of some sort. Uh, I don't mind telling you there would be lots of dents (laughs) <laughs> in me, I would I would have been repaired many many times. Yeah, you had a few I, shunts, I, haven't you? I'd never be pristine, but uh, but I I I would be a, a a a rock climber. You know, there's rock climbers with a big claw suspension things yeah. that go up these huge rocks. I would be a rock climber that could transform into something that that makes noise and does 250 miles an hour, like the Jaguar that I drove at Le Mans in 1988. Oh, goodness. And I, I don't know whether that's the type of answer people give, but that type of scattered, transformer, multiple repaired, rock climber, high speeder, <laughs> that's me. And I know nobody makes a vehicle like that. Nice answer to that question. Yeah. I love answers like that. Yeah, I had some yeah. very unique ones, that's for sure. Uh, kind of draws out the the 
attitude of my guests who uh, who they see when they look in the mirror. So I think you did a very nice job with that. Very cool. Now, I always ask my guests about great books. Now, you've written some wonderful books. Race to Win, there's a first edition by, of course, Derek Daly. There's Race to Win, second edition. And your book, A Champion's Path, which is marvelous as well. Is there another book on the horizon for Derek? I'm working on a book uh, right now, uh, which is called um, Race to Judgment, cool. which, is, uh, which is something that happened in Indianapolis that I thought is a valuable capture because it's evidence of how betrayal and, and perjury can win out over truth and facts. Nice. And I just think it's, it's a valuable story and something that, you know, an area that I've never uh, been involved in before. I've also started my autobiography. Believe it or not, I sat beside a woman on a flight, never met her before, but I sit beside her on a flight across the country, and she just started simply asking me questions. Hey, what do you do? Who are you? Where, where are you done? And at, at this stage, I was, this is now 20 years ago. Oh, my gosh. And, and so she would ask me pointed questions. And again, the stories that I told her, she was fascinated by and, when, and would lead to another question. Mm -hmm. And... As she was leaving, she reached over, put her hand on my arm, and she says, I'm a book publisher, and you need to write a book. <laughs> and again, Mark, as I told you earlier, the stories and the experiences that she asked me that I just relayed to her were normal to me, so I didn't think they were that remarkable. But she said, you got to capture this because they're so amazing. So I finally started to put down a lot of thoughts and some of them are amazing when I think back to it. But uh, it'll take me a lot of years because Race to Win, for example, that took me five years to write. Wow. I, I wrote it all myself. So I, I, I wrote it myself. I edited it myself. I corrected it myself. I added to it. I took a piece out. And it just takes time. Yes. But it, be it became – the reason I did it is because – when my son Connor was coming up through the junior series in America from go-karting up to Indy Lights, he won everything. And so I had moms and dads ask me, well, how does my son or my daughter do something like that? You know, you had an advantage because you're in the sport. <laughs> and I thought, wouldn't it be nice if I could capture, because I had access to all the information and access to all the people. I could ask them the questions. Right. I said, wouldn't it be nice if I captured the seven skills necessary to develop a complete champion race car driver and put it in book form and so every mom and dad could buy the book. <laughs> and yeah. that's exactly what the passion became. And seven or eight years after, or maybe nine years after it was published, it's still evergreen and it still sells today. Nice. And Mario Andretti himself said, Derek, this is the Bible for young drivers because they don't know how to navigate the sport. And the parents spend a fortune making the wrong choices because they don't know how to navigate the sport or what to concentrate on. So it's a thrill for me to think that it had an impact on, on young drivers. And quite honestly, uh, about a year ago, I was at a dirt race, right, in a dirt race in Indianapolis. Connor was racing, and I had a driver coach walk up to me, and he said, Derek, I read your book. He said, I have become a different and a better coach because of what I read in your book. Nice. I thought, man, that was cool, because it was never intended to help driver coaches, but, but I just realized it was a great give back for me that can still help spread the word across the sport and help grow the sport organically from, you know, from the very early stages. Yeah. You know, Derek, it's a wonderful story. And I'll, I'll tell listeners out there, we all have aspects of our lives that can benefit others. And I've said this many times, my listeners know this, is when we give back to others is when we really feel the best about ourselves. And it's the one big thing I've learned about the secret sauce to life is giving back and helping others. And yeah. lots of times we don't realize that our adventures and our journey can be very useful, youthful, and youthful, but useful to even young people who are trying to set off on the same thing. So I'm going to put a link to uh, Derek's uh, show notes page and his website uh, on his show notes page, I should say, derekdaily.com slash books. And you can get these books and we look in eager anticipation at Race to Judgment and the autobiography. So uh, you better get those done so that we can get those on our shelves. Uh, you've taken me on a wonderful ride today, but before I let you go, I'm going to let you go on a ultimate drive. Open book here. I've got a big checkbook. Doesn't matter what it costs. I'm going to provide you with any vehicle you'd like. <laughs> you can drive anywhere you'd like and with anybody living or deceased. Yeah. What does that look like for you? Um, Let's start with the car. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, let's start with the location. 
Oh, okay. I, I would love to drive the Mili Miglia in uh, Italy. Yeah. I would just love to drive that. And if I was to drive that with somebody, my choice would be Sterling Moss. Unfortunately, he's not here. Sterling Moss was one of those heroes when I grew up. We, you know, we knew of Sterling Moss. You know, if, if ever you get stopped for speeding in America, the cop might say to you, who do you think you are, Mario Andretti? <laughs> right. Well, in England, it was, who do you think you are, Sterling Moss? Yes. Even though he never became world champion, he was regarded as just the icon for anybody interested in the sport. So so I'd love to drive at the Mili Miglia with Sterling Moss. And, of course, I'd have to be in the Mercedes, in the 300 SLR that he made famous. Yeah. Number, number, number 722. And I see their... They're they're bringing back well they're 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 not recreating it but they're reliving the memories of Sterling Moss in that car uh now, you know now that he's unfortunately uh, passed away but but at least he made it to ninety years of age he oh. had a good run well yeah but but I don't know whether I could pick anything better than that Mercedes with Sterling Moss and then Millie Miglia <laughs> imagine that that'd be cool. And you said you'd make that happen for me. Yeah, I, I got a little bit of work ahead of me, pal. Uh, <laughs> ooh, I, yeah, well, I better get to work. Well, before I let you go, and I know you're going to have something eloquent here, uh, could you share maybe some parting words of wisdom, inspiration, a mantra, something with our listeners today to, as if you haven't already motivated them enough today? Okay, well, so I read a book recently, Alonso Jr.'s Checkered Past. Yeah. And I don't know whether many people have read it, but it is an unbelievable tale of destruction, success, how to lose it all and how to come through the other end. And, and the most amazing thing about that is I know Al well. He's been to my house. In 1983, he was, I think he might have been 21. You know, he was one of the heroes that I, that I looked to because, wow. Wow, Alonso Jr. You know, to my mind, he was like Alonso Sr. and Johnny Rutherford and Mario Andretti and all those big names. But I read his book and I, I sent a tweet out afterwards about how impressed I was that he took the time to do that. And 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 in the tweet, I said, you're never beaten when you're knocked down. Mm. You're only beaten when you stay down. And he didn't stay down, although he could have so easily. And I think that's important because Every single person who may listen to this podcast or in the world today, we all have difficult days. We all have a cross to bear, as my mother always said. We all will go through challenging times and get knocked down. And you're never beaten unless you stay down. (laughs) And and I, I think that's so important to grasp. And it's easy to say, you know, to say these things or to have it on your wall. But I think when people grasp it and I think when they own it and I think when they, you know, log it away, it gives them a little bit of an inspiration that 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 keeps pushing them through with a focus. It doesn't matter what happened. I'm focusing forward. And I will tell you, I've been I've been hurt physically and emotionally more than anybody could hurt me that way again in my years past, but I've always been able to, and I think I've got this from my dad, uh, uh, you know, you forever look forward. Even if it's murky, keep going forward because all the new bright sunshine is forward. It's not back. And so, you know, I don't often get a chance to, you know, directly talk to the people other than the keynote speeches, but, you know, there are two things that 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 you know that stay with me and my youngest you know you, you know obviously you know that connor my my oldest son is is an indycar driver my youngest christian is a five-time world jet ski champion awesome and and he always went on a different path but what came for him that resonated was make sure you concentrate on the process not on the prize because the process is what leads you to being able to get the prize. Without the process, you cannot get the prize. So if you just do everything right in the process, the byproduct is you position yourself for the prize. And so that meant a lot to him, whereas, you know, never, you know, never beaten when knocked down, only beaten when stay down resonates with a lot of people who are going through a difficult times. So I, I don't know whether that you know means a lot, but that's, 
you know, that's just two things that stick out to me that are important sort of guidelines in life that I think could help anybody and everybody. Very inspirational and a really nice message for as we dive into the new year here. You know, I had the author of that book, Jade Gers, as a guest uh, late last year on the show. I read the book. It's mm-hmm. awesome. Uh, Al Hunter Jr., A Checkered Past. Um, one of the things that I loved about that book was the fact that Al's doing a lot better today. He's recently married. He's improved his life. And there was a great line in there. And I, I, I put it on my weekly blog on the Cars yeah website. And I ended that blog with, being human is given, but keeping our humanity is a choice. Yeah. Yeah. Great, great yeah. message from Little Out. It's a great book. For you listeners, that's another great book along with Derek's books. You need to get your hands on. It's very inspirational. Uh, Jay did a wonderful job with Little Al because Little Al was very much involved in that book. It's not a tell-all. Little Al was part of that book. So uh, get mm-hmm. your hands on that. Well, again, I want to remind everybody that's a wonderful event coming up Saturday, February 12th in beautiful Fountain Hills, Arizona, Concord in the Hills. Why not start off the new year going to a wonderful car show, meeting wonderful people like Derek and the other people that have been on the show this week. And of course, there's going to be, I think, a thousand cars at this event. So check it out at concordinthehills.org. Derek, hey, this has been tremendous. Thank you for sharing some time with me today, sharing your inspiration with our listeners. Until you and I talk again, my friend, I'll see you at Concord in the Hills. Thank you, Mark. This was great fun. Cars Yeah! has teamed up with TechForce Foundation, one of our charities of choice, to help young people who love cars, problem solving, and working with their hands pursue careers as professional technicians. From auto, collision, and restoration techs to motorcycle boats, race cars, and aviation, TechForce covers the gamut of technician opportunities. Technical education and the skills trades matter, and we need qualified skilled technicians to keep our vehicles rolling. Learn how you can help to power the technical workforce at techforce.org today. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah! Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.